Homelessness and drug addiction are problems in every U.S. city, but San Francisco, California could be considered its epicenter. With four to 500 drug dealers in a 10-mile radius, the city has deployed 60 nonprofits to work to improve the situation and spends $100,000 per year per homeless person. How did this happen? My next guest is one man who's going to share how it happened to him. He went from being a suburban dad to sleeping in a doorway in the Tenderloin District. Now clean and sober, he uses his up-close and personal experience as a bridge between the reality of the streets and the meeting room of policymakers. Today he's going to share his story as we ask the question, is California's homelessness problem solvable? Solution seeker, recovery advocate, six years sober, Tom Wolf. Thank you so much, Tom, for being here. Hi, Meredith. It's so great to be here. Thank you for having me. So you were a municipal employee, a suburban dad, like I said. How did you end up living on the streets of San Francisco? Ah, oh, man. Well, it, it all started in early 2015, where I had to have surgery on my foot to repair an old injury that I had. And they had to break my foot and reset it and put two titanium screws in my foot to stabilize it. And after surgery, they sent me home with a 30-day supply of 10 milligram oxycodone tablets for the pain. And I basically didn't use those pills as directed. You know, one, one pill every four to six hours wasn't cutting it for the pain. So one day I decided to try two. That made me feel a little better. And one day I got brave and I decided to try three. And when I hit that 30 milligram threshold, that's when I kind of went over the edge into a state of euphoria or I was basically high and all my problems melted away. So it wasn't just the pain that went away. It was all any marital problems I was having, any financial problems. You know, at the time I had two small kids and a mortgage that was upside down. So we were feeling the crunch, right? And this oxycodone just took all of that away and made everything good for about four hours. And I loved it. I loved that high so much so that I spent the next five or so years chasing that high down. And I never found it again until I tried fentanyl for the first time. That's when I actually like caught that first high feeling again. And we'll talk about that later. But, you know, that addiction grew over time. So where, you know, after 10 days, I was already running out of those pills. I tried to get more from my doctor. Of course I couldn't. Uh, and so I actually went on the internet. I went, I Googled up where can I buy pills on the street in San Francisco. And it took me to YouTube and some references to an intersection in the Tenderloin called Pill Hill. Sure enough, I drove down there with my boot on my foot, and there were five or six people at the time in 2015 that were selling a variety of different opioids on the street, from Vicodins to Percocets to Roxycodone to all the way up to 80 milligram oxycodone tablets. And so I started buying my pills on the street to keep that high going. And over the next 18 months, my tolerance grew. So at the peak of my addiction, I was taking 560 milligrams of oxycodone every day just to stay well or just to function at that point. You know, I had returned to work, so I was now a functioning addict at my job and my job performance was slipping because I was nodding out at my desk, things like that. Uh, and I was going bankrupt. All the while, I was doing my best to hide all of that from my wife and my kids, uh, even though I didn't hide it well. Uh, and I'll just say that, you know, if you're a family out there that's experienced addiction, you understand what a huge role denial plays in addiction of a family member, you don't want to believe that it's true. And I think that's the space my wife was living in at the time, just trying to survive with two preteen kids, trying to raise them and hold everything together while I was emptying out our bank accounts to buy dope on the street at 30 bucks a pill, seven pills a day. That's $210 a day times seven days a week. So I easily blew through a hundred grand the levy broke when one day in the mail, my wife got the mail instead of me, and there was a foreclosure notice in the mail. That's when it all hit the fan. I was cut off from all the money. My wife knew what was going on, I think, but still, you know, I was lying and denying yeah. everything. And that's when I made the fateful decision to switch to heroin because I could just walk down one block from that intersection in the Tenderloin and buy heroin on the street from the organized drug dealers that are operating out here. And I bought three dimes of heroin for 30 bucks and I'm a diabetic. So I have needles at home. So I went back onto YouTube and I pulled up one of those harm reduction videos and I learned how to inject drugs into my arm. And I became an intravenous drug user at that point. And that's when everything completely fell apart. Uh, I stopped going to work. I lost my job. 
And basically, for lack of a better term, I was just a full-blown drug addict at that point that was prioritizing the drugs and my addiction over everything else, including my own kids. So how common is a story like this, that drug addiction begins with a prescription from a doctor? Well, it's extremely common. And in fact, it's what laid the foundation for the current drug crisis that you see today. The the whole OxyContin crisis of the 90s and 2000s that started off in Appalachia and the Rust Belt in the United States and kind of spread across the United States where doctors were overprescribing, where big pharma was downplaying the addictive effects of OxyContin to doctors and the FDA. And they all believed it. And at one point on the FDA's own website, they actually talked about how OxyContin was not addictive or not very addictive. Non-habit forming is the term that they actually used. And that led to at least 20 million people in the United States getting addicted to OxyContin in the 90s and 2000. It led to pain clinics, which are were very prevalent in places like Florida, where you could just go in and say, oh, I hurt my back. And then they would write you a prescription for like 80 Oxycontin pills. And then you were off to the races. And that has kind of spilled over into this next generation now with illicit drugs, because of course the government is about 10 years behind where they should be in responding to this drug crisis and restricted the, the prescription of opioids and oxy, oxycodone and oxycontin. And so people obviously were still addicted and now their kids were addicted and they turned to the street and the cartels figured out how to make synthetic fentanyl. And here we are today. Wow. Purdue was one of the main producers of Oxy. Do you feel like retribution has been paid? Absolutely not. I mean, come on. They made billions upon billions of dollars off the back of the sick and addicted in the United States and innocent people ruined a bunch of careers of doctors who maybe meant well, but they themselves got addicted sometimes. And, you know, there's been settlements that they've made that have been thrown out and more settlements that have been thrown out uh, at the court level. Uh, And honestly, I think the Sacklers deserve to be in prison, all of them, the entire family. I think every penny that they have of assets should be seized and used to fund drug treatment across the country and not like everybody gets a check for 12 bucks like a class action lawsuit but actually <laughs> money put towards opening treatment beds across the United States so we can start working towards getting people healthy again in this country and I'll just add that right now in the United States there are over 40 million people so we're talking about 10% of the entire population of the United States is struggling with a drug addiction right now jeez i did not know that stat Are we at risk for a repeat with any other pharmaceuticals? Well, it's hard to say. You know, like I said, so the cartels have figured out how to make illicit fentanyl, how they they figured out how to purchase these three precursor chemicals from China. They put them together, mix them together in these clandestine labs in Mexico, and voila, you have fentanyl or a version of fentanyl that they've been able to mass produce and smuggle into the United States by the metric ton. Okay, so last year, Border Control estimates 20 metric tons of illicit fentanyl was smuggled into the United States. So yeah, we are in danger because you can mix that drug with a bunch of different things. And you're seeing it in places like Philadelphia, where now you hear about this drug called Trank, which is a a xylazine, which is a horse tranquilizer not meant for human consumption, being mixed into the fentanyl because it enhances the effects of the fentanyl. But the side effects of it, because it's not meant for human com- consumption, is that you're seeing people's flesh rot right off of their bodies. You're seeing necrosis actually occurring oh amongst users. Uh, and so you're seeing all these different variations start to come out that are just you know, adding to the overdose deaths and adding to the suffering and making it harder and harder and harder for us to get people off the street, off the drugs, and into recovery. That is intense. You mentioned the role of the cartel. You yourself ended up working for the cartel at one point. Tell me how that happened. Well, indirectly. Okay, so I was a homeless drug addict on the street. And so what would happen is that you have these organized drug dealers in San Francisco. They're all from Honduras. That's a fact. It's not a racist thing to say that. It's well documented that we have anywhere between 500 and 1,000 organized drug dealers operating in San Francisco. And the cartels have figured out some type of pipeline from Honduras to bring these young men and women up here to sell illicit fentanyl on our streets. They don't just sell fentanyl. They sell meth and crack cocaine and powder cocaine. They're drug dealers. 
And one of the common things that they do is they use people that are homeless on the street addicted to drugs as decoys. So they would, for example, have me hold their stash of drugs and they would pay me with heroin or crack cocaine to hold their stash of drugs so that if they got busted on the street corner, they only had a very small amount of drugs in their possession, but I was holding like two ounces, right? And the cops are going to just look at me and be like, oh, he's just a homeless guy. We're just going to leave him alone. And that, that actually is something that's very common on the street. It's a form of exploitation because, hey, I was a drug addict. I was pretty much willing to do anything, including stealing, to get those drugs. So this guy's handing me a dime of heroin and say, hey, just put this in your pocket. I absolutely went for it, right? And that worked out for about three months until one day the police decided to do a sting operation on the block that I was on. And that day I happened to be holding for six different drug dealers at the same time. So I had about four and a half ounces of drugs on me. It's interesting. The cops weren't looking for the dealers. They were looking for the guy with the drugs. So I took off running around the corner, tried to jump on the bus. It was coming down the street and I turned around and an unmarked police car came up and they busted me with all this, all these drugs on me. And you know, if you've ever watched The Wire, you're thinking, oh man, that's it. I'm going to go to prison. I got booked into jail. I spent 16 hours in jail. And then they released me back to the streets on my own recognizance with no bail. So they just okay. let me go, basically. Hold on. Yeah, yeah. that's confusing. So, because <laughs> you're right. <laughs> A normal person would think like, okay, jail time, here we go. But you didn't even have to pay anything? They just let you out? They just let me out. Yeah. So this is, you know, criminal justice reform in a nutshell, right? Of what we're witnessing here, where it's like, you know, they recognize, okay, he's not the drug dealer. He's obviously a drug user, despite the fact that I had four and a half ounces of heroin on me. And I got charged with felonies, you know, for holding all those drugs. I had a bunch of misdemeanors too. But, you know, with the current reform-minded outlook around criminal justice and public safety in California and really across the United States and most places, they didn't feel like I was a threat. So they let me go uh, with no bail. And of course, I just returned right to the street, right back into homelessness. And I went right back to the block. I showed the dealers the jail wristband that they gave me is kind of like my badge of proof showing that, yes, I didn't take off with your drugs. I actually got busted by the police. And it's interesting. The dealers all kind of just shrugged and they were like, yeah, we understand. It's like part of their overhead. They understand that this happens from time to time. And I didn't get hacked up with a machete or anything like that. They knew that I went to jail and the whole deal was is that if I was going to hold these drugs and get paid in drugs, if I got busted, I had to take the fall because I had all the drugs. So now if I snitched on them, I would have been hacked up with a machete or killed. So you can't do that. And that's the deal that you make out there on the street. And those are the kinds of impossible deals that you will make as someone struggling with addiction when you're homeless on the street. You do things in your addiction that you would never normally do had you been sober or not addicted to drugs. And I could say the same thing about my family and the things that I did to my wife and kids. Of course, I love my wife and kids. I love them with all my heart and I do anything for them. But when you're addicted to drugs, addiction actually implants itself in your brain as one of your basic survival instincts right alongside food and sex and fighting. Here comes addiction too, implanting itself. And so you start prioritizing that over your own kids. So you know, I'm not proud of it, but I did things like drive under the influence with my kids in the car. I did things like go down to the tenderloin and buy drugs with my kids in the car. And this is before I became homeless. And all of those things my kids remember, and it's part of their experience. It's something that we had to go through a lot of counseling to work through. But I'll say this, that recovery from addiction is the only thing that gave me an opportunity to make those things right, to make amends to my wife and kids. And so now I can honestly say, you know, it's I'm six years clean and sober and I've, I reconciled with my wife and kids a couple of years ago. They were willing to forgive me, but it took a lot of work, a lot of effort. And most of all, it took me staying clean and sober. Yeah. And this, I imagine, is why you are against the live and let die kind of thinking of let's let addicts decide when they're ready to get clean. Well, look, you know, it, that idea may have had some merit 10 years ago when we're talking about heroin, because when you use heroin, you can live for 30 years as a heroin addict. It's not a pretty existence, but you're alive, right? But fentanyl doesn't offer you that time. From what I've seen on the street right now, and I'm out on the street often, all the time, talking to thousands of people on the street. The average lifespan is like two to three years for people once they switch over to fentanyl. That's what it seems. Now, that's anecdotal. I don't have evidence of that. But I can tell you right now that 
your lifespan will be dramatically shortened with a drug that's 10 to 100 times stronger than the drug that you were using previously. So that type of mindset of supporting drug users until they're ready, which is the current harm reduction mindset, the current mindset within most of drug policy in the United States is not working. Uh, and it's not working because the people that they are supposedly supporting are dying anyway from fentanyl overdose. So we as a community must make a decision to intervene to save those lives. So when you were experiencing homelessness and you were sleeping in a doorway, why couldn't you get shelter? Well, so for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, I didn't know where I could go to get shelter. Like, I want to make that clear. There's somewhere between eight and 20,000 homeless people in San Francisco. There's 47,000 homeless people in the city of Los Angeles. If you went down to Skid Row and started asking people, do you know where you can go to get treatment in San Francisco or in LA? They wouldn't know. They wouldn't know. They might know where there's a shelter because in LA they do have a bunch of shelters down on Skid Row, but San Francisco doesn't have that. We've got like four shelters in the whole city. Oh. And then on top of that, you're addicted. You're, you're, yeah. <laughs> so on top of that, you're addicted to drugs. You can't use drugs inside the shelter. So that's an immediate barrier right there. There's rules inside shelters. Like you can only bring a limited amount of stuff with you and you have to be in by 10 PM, things like that, that you don't want to have to follow. So yeah, when street outreach groups like street crisis response teams go out to the street and do outreach to homeless people, you know, right now the data that's coming back in San Francisco is like 90% of the time they leave them in the same spot that they found. Them. And that's because they're coming at them with this approach of, well, we're going to build rapport over time. So maybe after eight or nine visits to you, you're going to decide that you want to accept services. Well, the problem with that, there's two problems with that. One, person's using fentanyl every 90 minutes. Okay. Every so every time minutes? they use fentanyl, they're playing with their life every 90 minutes. So well, that's a whole other thing. I okay, did not, first you of were, all, fentanyl, I'm sorry. I'm so naive. Cause like, I don't know. <laughs> Cause you know, you were saying, okay, oxy every four hours. So I'm like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. So why every yeah. 90 minutes? Well, this is, here's the thing. So fentanyl is 10 to 100 times stronger than heroin or morphine. It's 10 times stronger generally than heroin, a hundred times stronger than morphine. Okay. It also metabolizes in your body faster. So when you ingest it, it actually gets into your bloodstream much, much quicker than heroin used to do. Okay. So the effect is like literally immediate. As soon as you inhale the vapors from fentanyl or inject it in your vein, it's 100%, 100% like absorption rate in your body and you are just gone at that point. The problem with that drug, because it metabolizes so quickly, it wears off much faster in your bloodstream than heroin used to. So you have to use it more often. So for folks on the street right now, where you used to be able to go six to eight hours between doses of heroin, you are now having to use fentanyl every 90 minutes to two hours to avoid withdrawal. So what you end up finding out a lot is that you end up seeing people on the street that aren't even getting high anymore. They just don't want to go into withdrawal. They don't want to get dope sick. They're afraid to get dope sick. So they're using it every 90 minutes to two hours as they can get money to do so to not have that, to not experience that feeling of withdrawal. And for anyone out there that's listening, that's in recovery from addiction, you know what I'm talking about. It's one of the scariest things and maybe one of the, the biggest barriers of all to anyone that's using an opioid, a heroin or oxycodone or oxycontin. It's maybe the biggest barrier of all for people to seek treatment is they're afraid of those feelings of withdrawal, which feel like the flu and COVID and stomach flu and like you're getting kicked in the stomach all at the same time and you end up wrapped up in a ball on a cold sweat throwing up all over yourself for hours and sometimes days at a time. So people don't want to feel that. So this is the difference with fentanyl. And because of it, and, and then because of that 100% absorption rate, people love it. I've had people describe it to me and I would describe it too as someone put a warm blanket over me. When I smoked fentanyl, I remember just this warm, fuzzy feeling coming over me, and I just remember walking down the street, and I kept bumping into the wall because I couldn't control my leg movements because I was so high, and eventually I passed out in a doorway, and I woke up like two hours later in a crouch. Uh, the problem is too many people aren't waking up now. They're just dying, and so again, this is why we need that type of intervention that's beyond just supporting drug users. You're going to have to start compelling people on the street, that subset of people on the street that are committing those behaviors of stealing, of bipping cars, breaking into cars, of you know, selling their bodies for drugs, holding drugs for the dealers, things like that. 
they have to be held accountable and they must be compelled towards some type of treatment solution. Thank you for that education. There was so much there that I had no idea. And, you know, we often ask about this, about, well, why can't they find a shelter? And I didn't know that people didn't know that there were shelters. Or I find it very odd that San Francisco is so much larger than Pensacola, Florida, and yet we have more shelters than you. That's unusual. So what happens after people get shelter? Well, the idea is is that you get connected to services. There's this whole argument around homelessness is primarily a housing problem and we need to provide housing plus services to people. And I agree to an extent that housing is a large equation in the homeless issue and resolving the homeless issue. But what I try to frame to people and make people understand is that by the time you get down to the street where you're living in a tent and you're smoking fentanyl or meth all the time, you're beyond just let's give you an apartment. You're beyond that. You need treatment. Treatment is what solves addiction. And when you take someone and you house them in supportive housing, and then they have what they call wraparound services available that are there, but they are voluntary, voluntary. That means that that individual who's addicted to fentanyl is not required in any way, shape, or form to access any of those voluntary services. So what ends up happening? They continue to use, but now they're using a loan behind a locked door in their own apartment. And what happens to them? Well, in San Francisco right now, we're averaging 30 overdose deaths a month inside of what we call our SROs, which are single resident occupancy apartments for people that were formerly homeless. 30 people a month are dying inside supportive housing in San Francisco right now because of fentanyl, because we've isolated them, which if you, again, know anything about recovery, you know that the most dangerous thing you can do to an addict is to isolate them right? And that's what we're doing. And it's having this, you know, unintended effect of, of this really high rates of overdose deaths. And so that kind of brings into question, are the solutions that we are putting forth to address homelessness actually working? And, you know, if you just look at the money alone in California, we've spent $24 billion in the last five years on homeless services, yet homelessness grew 31% in our state. Just looking at that alone, you could make an easy argument that what we are doing now is not working. So you said that because fentanyl has changed the game, that people need to be compelled to rehabilitate. How were you compelled? So I was on the six strikes in your out plan in that I got arrested six times on the street. So after the first time that I got arrested, I was basically a mark by the cops. Every time the cops saw me, they were hopping out of their cars and messing with me because either I was inside my stay away order, which is an order a judge will put on you to stay 150 yards away in a circle from the block in which you were first arrested. I got arrested in April of 2018, and I got arrested five more times between April 2018 and June of 2018 on the street until finally after my sixth arrest, they were like, you caught too many, too many cases too close together. We can't let you out anymore. And I proceeded to spend the next three months in county jail where I got clean. And in our county jail here in San Francisco, they give you something called medication assisted treatment. They gave me buprenorphine or Suboxone, which is an opioid agonist that replaces the fentanyl that's in your system and stops the withdrawals so that you're able to overcome the physical aspects of your addiction easier. And they gave that to me for five days and then they cut me off. And then I just spent, you know, the, pretty much the next three months in jail, just sober. I wasn't in recovery, but I was sober. And that was the kind of intervention that I needed. Now I'm not suggesting that that works for everyone, but it worked for me. And there's a subset of people on the street that require that type of intervention. So when we talk about solutions to the homeless crisis, it's really important that we frame it in, in this way and that we need a public health approach. It's true. But law enforcement also plays a role, and we need to figure out a way to get those two groups to start working together in earnest, much as they do in Europe, in places like Portugal and in Amsterdam and the Netherlands. They found a way for public health and the police to partner together, and it's been very, very effective in their approach. I definitely want to talk more about that in a minute, but you said something that I need clarity on. You said I was sober, but not in recovery. What's the difference? Oh gosh, the difference is everything. So learning how to live in recovery isn't just like going through the 12 steps of AA. It's actually learning a whole new way to live your life. You literally have to flip the script on your life and start realizing the importance of gratitude 
and being grateful for the things that you have as opposed to the things that you don't have. And really kind of taking that to heart. For a lot of people, that means finding faith. For me, that meant finding faith. And I'm not saying that that's for everyone, but that really was a huge thing for me. Working with other people, having other people that are in recovery from addiction that are in the same boat as you or that were in the same boat as you at one point, working with them so that you know that you're not alone. Learning the lessons from them, from their experience to help you kind of learn how to live again. So it's really more like I could be sober all day long, but if I don't have these tools that I learned in recovery of how to live my life differently by a different set of values than what I was living it before, I wouldn't be where I am today. And that's the big difference between just stopping drugs and actually learning how to live a life in recovery, which it's not just me, it's my whole family. My wife and my kids have embraced those same principles that I came home with. And now we as a family live in recovery, we live in faith, we're honest with each other. Is it perfect? No, we're just like any other family. But we don't have those lies. We don't have those secrets anymore. We don't have a lack of faith anymore. We really believe that whole term from the Bible it talks about faith is believing in things you cannot see and the hope of things to come. I think it's okay to have hope. I really do. And that was the big difference is that I went from having no hope and no purpose to being full of hope and full of purpose. And that's all the difference. It's like a rehab of your spirit. Yeah. Oh, look, re recovery is absolutely a, uh, there's a spiritual aspect to it. Okay. You know, I'm not a huge, like big organized religion guy, but I have tons of faith. I believe in God, you know, that whole thing. And however you want to call God, whether it's Jesus or, or Buddha or the universe, it doesn't matter. As long as you believe in a power greater than yourself, then you never really have to feel alone. And that was the, the super worst thing about being on the street. Yes, I had guilt. Yes, I had shame for the things I did and not being able to see my kids and all those things. But it was that I was I felt alone all the time. And it was weird because I was in, a, in like an encampment on the street around other people. So I wasn't technically alone, but it was like being with a bunch of people who were also all feeling alone. And we we're all alone at the same time because all we could think about is our drugs. And that's a miserable existence. And we can do better. And as a community, we have to step up and do better and be better because you're watching entire cities on the West Coast become destabilized because of drugs. Portland, Oregon has completely become destabilized because of the fentanyl crisis and the homeless crisis. San Francisco is destabilized, although we're fighting back. L.A. is so big, so you don't really see it. But if you go into downtown L.A., 40,000 people on the street, how can you not say that they don't have this huge crisis? So it's not just here. Oakland, California is literally falling apart between crime and homelessness. It's ridiculous what's happening. It's time for us to pivot. It's time to bring some accountability back into the mix here. The criminal justice reforms aren't working here in California because we didn't provide the infrastructure that's needed to support all those changes when we released 70,000 people from prison early. And a lot of them ended up on the street or reoffending. So we just have to be real about the challenges that are in front of us and be willing to make those hard choices. And that's you know where I come in. Like you said, I try to be that bridge from the street to policymakers to get them to change their mind. And it's Democrat and Republican. I don't care who you are. It's all of our problems. So talk to me about Portugal, because you mentioned 40,000 people in downtown LA living on the streets. We had a small problem in Pensacola for a time where there was an encampment underneath the interstate bridge, and it was really distressing. And I went to a, a city hall meeting. There was a few people who had been homeless in the past who really brought that perspective that you also have, like, hey, they need to be compelled to quit. And I, I don't know, and this was a few years ago. So I don't know at what level fentanyl was prevalent compared to today. So who knows that bit of it. But how are they compelling people in Portugal? What's working there? What's there before and after? Okay, well, let me just preface this by saying Portugal and Europe has not experienced fentanyl yet like we have. They haven't had the wave of fentanyl. Everything over there is still heroin, okay? But in 2001, Portugal decriminalized drugs as a country, not just in a state or in a city, but the entire country agreed to decriminalize drug possession and instead institute what they call dissuasion courts. It's really an administrative court where they bring people in who get busted using drugs on the street. They don't put you in jail, but they, they basically bring the person in. They bring a therapist or a psychiatrist in. 
that they have this administrative judge. Sometimes they'll bring the parent of the guy that's using too, and they basically try to convince the person to go to treatment, to get help. And while they've been doing that, Portugal built 61 therapeutic communities across their country. They built massive treatment facilities and transitional housing facilities for people so they have a place to send people when they come through these dissuasion courts, okay? What they, did, what they didn't do is they didn't open safe injection sites until 20 years later. Instead, they focused on the problem of actually building out an infrastructure to support people in recovery. And it's been very, very effective because they actually have somewhere to send them. And this is an argument that most of us agree on on all sides of this issue is that we don't have enough resources in the United States in general, particularly out here on the West Coast, as far as drug treatment beds, shelters, transitional housing, housing. We don't have enough spaces to send people once they do go through the system. And that's part of why we're stuck in this kind of cycle over and over and over that's just been greatly exacerbated by the arrival of fentanyl on our streets. Now, what I worry with places like Portugal is that when the wave of fentanyl does hit them, and it will eventually hit them, how is this model going to play out when people are literally just dropping dead on your streets? That's one concern. But the other thing I really want to mention about Portugal is that there's a cultural difference. In the country of Portugal, they frown on drug use. They look down on illicit drug use. Like you literally have a mom open up her apartment window in the street when she sees someone using it and start yelling at the guy to stop, <laughs> right? <laughs> Here in the United States, we've been celebrating drugs in this country since the 60s, man. You know, started in the 60s. I'm a Gen X guy in the 80s. There's lots of songs about cocaine and Mr. Brownstone and all this stuff. You know, so we've been kind of celebrating drugs in the drug culture in this country now for a, for several decades. And, you know, weed's not a big deal. It's legalized and shrooms aren't a big deal. It's going to be legalized eventually. And OK, well, where do we stop? So we're going to just start giving out fentanyl patches to people and you're going to have a bunch of folks walking around addicted to, to opioids, which is a terrible, damaging, expensive addiction. And then who's going to pay for it? This is what kills me is all the harm reduction to say, well, we need a safe supplier. We need to legalize drugs. And I'm like, drugs aren't free. You know, the cartels aren't doing this to be altruistic. They're making like $70 billion a year between drugs and human trafficking and avocados. I mean, they're making a ton of money, right? That's random. And avocados. Well, they, they do. They're in the avocado business, right? So... My point is, is that, you know, a lot of these folks that talk about drug legalization, harm reduction, they're like, well, you know, if we just legalized it, gave it out to people, people would do better. And I'm like, well, who's going to pay for it? Well, like the government's going to pay for it. And I'm like, do you really want your government to be a drug dealer? Do you really want them? Are, are you willing to give up your tax dollars to fund someone's addiction? Are you really? I have a clarifying question because you said Portugal decriminalized and now you're talking about potential harms of legalizing. And I, for one, have a hard time understanding the difference between those two because, I mean, they sound kind of similar. So can you kind of educate me on how are those different? Well, well, most people assume when you talk about Portugal, they say, oh yeah, Portugal legalized drugs. No, they didn't. They decriminalized drugs, which means that instead of you going to prison with a felony because you have two and a half grams of fentanyl in your possession, you get your drugs taken away, maybe, maybe not. You get a citation to appear in court where they then try to urge you to go to treatment, but you don't get arrested and get taken to jail. That's decriminalization. Legalization would mean that you get to go into what amounts to what, like a modern day marijuana dispensary, except it would be for heroin or fentanyl. And you'd be able to go in there and go, yeah, I think today I want to try the black tar heroin. Let me get a gram of that. And you'd be able to take it and go use it. Now, of course, the harm reduction people are like, no, no, it would be dispensed, you know, pharmaceutically in, in a tight knit program. And I'm sitting here thinking, well, we already do that. It's called a prescription. Right. So what are they really asking for? And decriminalization is that first step towards legalization. And I just say that as a warning to people, because right now our current drug policy in the United States, the largest drug policy lobbying group in the United States is the Drug Policy Alliance. I have no problem calling them out. They received a 10-year, $50 million grant from the Soros Foundation to operate. And I say that, again, I'm a Democrat from San Francisco. Push for decriminalization, an end to the war on drugs, and eventually want drug legalization. 
And they are the biggest lobbyist in Washington, D.C. around drug policy. And so people like myself and others have finally gotten together and we've coalesced. And we're pushing back on that with our own group that's trying to take a more pragmatic kind of middle of the road approach that focuses on recovery from addiction, not giving people more drugs. I have another follow-up question. So thank you in advance for all of your patience with my what probably seem like overly simplistic clarifying questions, but hopefully someone out there, (laughs) it's helping them also. Because we started this conversation with you talking about how your very own addiction began through prescription. And we're now we're talking about how legalization of drugs and their recreational access can also cause problems. But isn't there this like middle place where instead of an NFL athlete being given these very addictive narcotics for his knee pain, that we could give him, you know, weed cream. Also therapeutically, instead of, you know, long drawn out, very expensive sessions, someone could have three sessions of ketamine or one session of ayahuasca. And actually it would help them overcome their addiction. I know there's some some research out of University of Alabama, Birmingham, specifically studying the use of psilocybin to overcome addiction of cocaine. Isn't there like this like middle place where we use plant medicine in a way that ancestral communities have leveraged them and not just willy nilly in the club? You know, it, probably I've heard conflicting studies on both sides of that. For me, like the ship has sailed on marijuana. For a lot of people, I mean, California it has anyway, it's legal here, you know, and I understand if you're going to use it in that way, the way you describe to help overcome like a football injury or something like that. I think that that's great. I think the issues that we're running into now are the lack of regulation around some of these things. So if we're going to decriminalize or legalize psilocybin and weed and all that, I think it's reasonable to have some regulations around it. I mean, even alcohol has regulations around it, right? You get pulled over, you're drinking and driving, you take a breathalyzer and it's 0.08 and you're done, right? Well, there's no way to do that for weed. I mean, I don't know how many times I've stopped at the gas station to gas up and the dude next to me comes out and his car is reeking of marijuana. So now I know that that guy's driving under the influence, but nothing's going to happen to him because if he gets pulled over, there's really no way for us to tell, right? If he's under the influence or not, right? There's no instant breathalyzer test that you can take or anything like that. So I'm not opposed to exploring different ways that you can use some of these plant-based items to help people manage their pain. What I'm concerned about is the one plant-based one that's truly addictive, which is opium. Okay, That's the one that's really destroying our communities. And meth, which is a chemical that's not even plant-based. And we've now departed from opium, and we're using chemicals to make fentanyl that's 10 times stronger, or carfentanil, which is 100 times stronger. So now we've moved into this chemical world. And I don't know, we could introduce these plant-based substances to help people, but for too many that are already addicted to that substance, it's such a long road back to even that, that we need to just start by stabilizing people, getting them off of that drug. And if that means using these other drugs to help with that, then so be it. Because to me, any of those things is better than being a fentanyl addict. The fentanyl, like literally, is like the lowest common denominator in addiction now. Like if you're a fentanyl addict, you cannot function, you cannot go to work, you can't hold on a job, you can't support your family. Like you can't do any of those things. And so I think we just need to understand this particular drug has changed the game and we need to pivot our approach to actually meet the actual change that has occurred as a result. So how do we make that pivot in dumpster fires like San Francisco? Because you you gave us this beautiful picture of Portugal, right? Where it's like, okay, step one, decriminalization, step two, step three. And that's really cool. But, I mean, San Fran, L.A., like, fan shit, it's already mixed together. So if you were in charge, what would be your first step towards compelling people who are living in encampments and getting high every 90 minutes to become clean and sober? Well, look, you know, you're going to have to start forcing some people to go into treatment that are on the street. You just have to. 
That means you're going to have to invest deeply in creating a lot of treatment spaces really fast, and you're going to have to invest deeply in creating a lot of shelter space really fast. If I were the governor of California, I would declare a state of emergency on homelessness in the state today. Okay, That would unlock federal dollars, and that would stop all the NIMBYs who don't want a shelter in their neighborhood, and I would just put up FEMA-style shelters around uh, as many communities as I could, because you have to understand, we have 191,000 homeless people in California. It's not like we have two or 3,000. 200,000 people experiencing homelessness, and it's probably more than that. And when you add in Oregon and Washington, we have half the entire homeless population just in those three states, in all of the United States, just in those three states in this country. Okay, I would treat it like, you know how we look at natural disasters, but it's even more than that because it's really a man-made disaster. But you have to take that type of approach where you have to call in the federal government for help. Army Corps of Engineers to build out those big tent-like shelters, call people in for service from the National Guard to help. Not to put boots on the ground with guns, but to actually help like with triage and treatment and getting people stabilized and getting them away from that environment and getting them uh, stabilized on medication-assisted treatment while you build out more permanent shelters and drug treatment along with the housing that you've been trying for decades to build in California that you can't do because it costs a million dollars a door here, but you still have to try. So that's where you start. Instead of, you know, we're doing everything piecemeal here and you're seeing an exorbitant waste of money and the results are actually going backwards. And even now our governor, Governor Newsom, has pivoted. He signed an executive order the other day that ordered cities to start clearing out homeless encampments because of the Supreme Court ruling on whether or not homeless encampments can be removed. And they now can. You're not violating their Eighth Amendment rights. And so we need a more comprehensive plan and treat it as the crisis that it actually is. It is a humanitarian crisis of epic proportions. And we, this whole soft, touchy-feely way of approaching people on the street saying, well, we just got to build relationships over time and all that, that's not going to work for a large subset of people that don't want your help to begin with and only care about getting that next hit of drugs. And that is what we need to address. Well, it's interesting now that you have described how the mechanism of fentanyl works. I mean, that's very eye-opening because it sounds more like a hostage takeover of their brain. And that feels very apocalyptic, very zombie movie, uh, I'm afraid. So I could see where a more aggressive approach would potentially work. I mean, what we're doing now isn't. Are there any states in North America that are doing it right, like they had a problem and they were able to remedy it? Not remedy, no. So there's one province in Canada, Alberta, which is where Calgary and Ottawa are. They've embraced what they call a recovery-oriented system of care for their drug crisis out there, where they're placing the focus on building out treatment and transitional housing. Uh, and they are compelling people into treatment. And they have a lot more tools than we do in the United States. They use different drugs up there. Along with Suboxone and Methadone, they have a drug called Sublocade, which cops carry around with them that they can give people if they consent to it, which nullifies the effects of opioids for 30 days in your body. And, you know, they have that here in the U.S., but it's really rare and it's like a thousand bucks a shot here. So it's not a tool that we have. And then in the United States, the city of Houston has done some good work on getting people housed. And this is where the housing first model can actually work if it's implemented correctly, because in Houston, they have no zoning restrictions and cheap land. And they're okay with prefabricated materials for housing. And so they can get housing built for cheap and fast. And guess what? They've reduced homelessness in their city. Has it solved it? No, but they're managing it a lot better. California, on the other hand, wants to decriminalize drugs. If they could, if they had their druthers, they would decriminalize drugs in this state. We have terrible criminal justice reforms that have resulted in everything being locked up at the store when you go. And it costs a million dollars a unit to build housing here. And it drives me nuts that the progressives in this state, as a Democrat, again, the progressives in this state talk about the need for housing. Y'all have been in charge for like 15 years. You know, since Schwarzenegger left the governor's mansion, you have been in charge. Where is the housing that you keep touting? You're responsible for making it easier for developers to build, yet you can continue to put more regulations and zoning exceptions in place and environmental regulations in place to make it harder and harder for people to build. And then you look around and you see 200,000 homeless people and you wonder why. It takes a more pragmatic, 
approach with someone that's willing to be honest and recognize that building 200,000 units of housing in California at a cost of $90 billion is not realistic. We need interim solutions. Mm, wow. Well, I really am cheering you on. I really do hope that San Francisco is something that 10 years from now, there's documentaries, plural, being made about how they turned it around and that we, they are pimping you out to other cities to go do talks and, <laughs> and be a consultant. Because, you know, it's not just about we don't want to see it. You know, I think if we really looked inside ourselves, we are bothered by homelessness because it's another person experiencing something terrible. And it's not just them. It's their mom, their brother. It's their sister. It's their dad. It's their, their child. For every person I see on the street, I will often think like, God, I wonder how many family members that person has that are also in this city and, and what that has done to that family. And can it be, can it be fixed? So I'm glad that this was a, an honest discussion, A, and B, as you pointed out, a hopeful discussion because you pointed out the need for hope. So thank you again. Please tell people where they can stay in touch with what you are doing with your nonprofit and how they can read more about that. Great. Well, so my biggest platform is on X or Twitter. You can find me. My handle is T Wolf Recovery. So I encourage you to look at my page and give me a follow if you can. And then I also have my own nonprofit. It's called the Pacific Alliance for Prevention and Recovery. It's associated with a larger foundation called the Foundation for Drug Policy Solutions. Their website is gooddrugpolicy.org. I suggest you go take a look. You'll see a bunch of pragmatic folks. Uh, including Dr. Kevin Sabet, Patrick Kennedy, General Barry McCaffrey, that are all a part of this organization. We're trying to bring a more balanced approach that's focused on recovery to America as a solution to its drug crisis. Thank you again, Tom. I really appreciate your time. This was great. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much.